Si confiara en la televisión, no te pudiera conocer. Porque en ella nunca pude ver a la llaman Ramonán que bailar. Le agradezco tanto a mi pueblo por resistir. Con el cumaco de su pecho y su agitado latir. Han doloroso a tus amores y a un poco de violín. Sudor de los trabajadores de obrero cultural que no parará. Está este canto, disque pa' amenizar Con el cocu y unos ramazos lo vamos a estimar Pa' que aprendan a respetar ¡Vamos pues! ¡Marcha de Si ya andas cansado de remodelar, entonces vente a destruir. Ya se agotará ese reformismo y vamos a construir. Hay que aclarar bien el camino para acabar la confusión. Esa etiqueta conformista no es lo que aspiro yo. No es lo que aspiramos, no. La alborada guiando esta canción, intentando calmar las penas de hoy, la de mi gente de su rabia y su clamor. Señalando a los traidores del amor Apunta creador la idea con la acción La alborada guiando esta canción, la canción. La okay, so hello everybody. So um, good evening, everyone. I am Michelle Elner. I am the Latin America campaign coordinator for Code Pink. Um, uh, uh, as a Venezuelan American, this webinar is very, very special for me. Uh, together with Task Force in the Americas, uh, Code Pink organized a very successful delegation to Venezuela last month. Uh, for 13 days, our group of uh, 15 delegates had the privilege of learning from and collaborating with the Venezuela socialist communities. And today we're here to uh, share the reality of what is happening in Venezuela uh, through the eyes and the experience of our delegates and our special guests from Venezuela. Uh, we will start exploring the impacts of US uh, policies on Venezuela and how the communes uh, are resisting the hybrid war uh, against their country. Our guests will share their experience of visiting three communes in Venezuela uh, and provide insights of the work uh, being developed in those communes. Uh, we will explore the lessons that can be learned from the experience in the communes in Venezuela and how their struggles can inspire us uh, to have concrete actions here for us here in the U.S. We hope to get you excited and and share the the message and and come with us in solidarity uh, with the people of Venezuela who are fighting for their sovereignty and for a better better world. 
Um, again, welcome to this exciting uh, webinar to celebrate the creative responses, the resilience and resistance of the Venezuelan people. I want to give a special thanks to our co-sponsors, the Claudia Jones School of Political Education, Sanctions Kill Coalition, the Instituto Simón Bolívar, the Unión Comunera, International Action Center, and of course, Task Force in the Americas. Um, so we are going to have an, an interpretation uh, in Spanish, uh, from Spanish to English. I just want you to locate this uh, globe that, that you can see in your um, Zoom um, with the English interpretation when our, our, our uh, guests uh, start um, in Spanish. Uh, I wanted also to inform you that unfortunately uh, we received uh, news that uh, one of our dear guests, Carlo Ron, will not be able to join us uh, due to an urgent family matter. Our thoughts are with Carlos and with his family in these difficult times, but we are so happy to and honored to have uh, Laura Franco from the Instituto Simón Bolívar also. Um, uh, so we kindly ask you for um, understanding and, and patience uh, if there is any difficulty that may arise, arise uh, due to this unexpected situation. I think we have everything covered, but just in case. So now I want to introduce uh, my dear comrade and co-host for tonight, uh, David Paul. David uh, was one of the co-coordinators co of the delegation along with Adrian Pine. He is a retired nurse practitioner and a member of multiple organizations, including the Task Force on the Americas, Venezuelan Embassy Protection Collective, Sanctions Kill Campaign, and the International Committee of DSA. David. Okay, thank, thank you for um, having me speak. And I'm really happy to be here to talk a little bit of just some general thoughts about my experience there um, just for a couple of minutes. And um, I was really um, happy to be there with everybody. And um, it was a great group. I think a good experience uh, for everybody. And um, hopefully we can convey that uh, today. I want to first say I've been to Venezuela a number of times and uh, this time as well, and especially this time, realized that this Bolivarian revolution is a real ongoing process that um, that, that Chav under Chavez's leadership, it really transformed society, uh, giving power to the people, and is also a reflection of a historic struggle against imperialism and colonialism that's uh, been going on for centuries. And you really see that in the people. And when we, um, this, we could see that the system of communes and the spirit of collective liberation that we saw in these communes really has its roots also in the Afro-Venezuelan and indigenous communities that goes back centuries. With all the challenges, internal opposition with international banker, backers and the US efforts to continually undermine the economy and any development of this socialist project with theft, sabotage, blocking of trade, it's essential for people to consolidate their efforts and resources to meet the needs of their own community. And we saw that on a daily basis there. I always remind, reminds me in my, this quote by uh, one of the leaders of the El Panal, uh, an urban uh, commune we visited. He said the Bolivarian process, um, about the Bolivarian process, that emancipation is the goal, socialism is the model, and the commune is the path to achieve it. And in these communes uh, that we visited, I was so impressed with the level of political consciousness and the internationalist perspective of the people, the and especially the level of organization on so many in so many uh, situations. The the level of debate and political education that they take very seriously. They encourage participation and developing leadership, and. It made it reminded me and made me think how that one of the biggest fears of the capitalist imperial elites is to see poor people and working class people organize themselves. And we saw that on the ground level of that kind of organization, which is the biggest threat to those forces. 
and especially when it extends to regional and international integration uh, and cooperation, as when Simon Bolivar's independence movement was uh, trying to achieve hundreds of years ago, and now in the efforts of many countries to find an alternative to U.S. Uh, hegemony. And Venezuela, it's so clear, is so much of a key to that struggle and why they are so determined to make this socialist project uh, fail. I'm so grateful to the Instituto, the Simón Bolívar Institute, and the Uni uh, Unión Comunera, uh, the Commune Union, that made this delegation a reality to give us a give North Americans a chance to have an intimate experience with Venezuelans and bring back a, a more clear sense of the reality of the harm of U.S. policies in the lives of Venezuelans, but also the courage and resilience and resistance uh, of the people there and what's possible when people organize themselves. And, and others will elaborate uh, later about this. And it was very fitting that we named this delegation after Kevin Zeese, a public interest lawyer and activist, a writer, a political strategist, a political visionary, a friend and inspiration to many people. And he was a, a courageous um, voice in many struggles domestically. And he was a true internationalist. His leadership, along with Margaret Flowers, his partner in the defense of the Venezuelan embassy, really came from a, a, um, a real deep sense of love and respect for the people of Venezuela and their struggle for sovereignty and dignity. And like the spirit of the communes, their passionate desire to empower the people in their communities, Kevin Zeese uh, always promoted popular power, encouraged people to find hope and value in their actions, raise their voices and become active, especially with young people. So we want to continue the, his legacy and uh, organize future brigades, hope to enhance the work of solidarity in the United States, uh, continue to create you know, ongoing bonds between the people of the United States and Venezuela, and work toward ending this criminal policy of sanctions. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm, now it's time I'm going to uh, introduce, if we're ready on um, all the other ends, is introduced our guest speaker is Laura Franco, who is the coordinator of exchange and cooperation at this uh, Simon Bolivar Institute for Peace and Solidarity, who uh, without it, it would have been hard to do the delegation like we did. They were so essential um, and Laura uh, specifically in helping us organize this group and organize the visits and the meetings we had uh, in the communities. She's a women's human rights activist and member of the Venezuelan popular feminism platform. And um, Laura has a lot to share and I'm um, very glad you're here, Laura, and can take the time to be with us. Bueno, muy emocionada de verles. Por aquí se les extraña mucho porque fue una experiencia muy hermosa la Brigada de Solidaridad que vincís. Eh, desde el Instituto Simón Bolívar queremos saludar además eh, que la brigada haya tomado esta iniciativa de dar continuidad a lo vivido, a la experiencia vivida en Venezuela y compartirla con muchas más compañeras y compañeros en los Estados Unidos, que es una de las rutas más importantes que nos hemos trazado para denunciar la situación de asedio y de agresión contra el pueblo venezolano, que es la situación que vivimos en la actualidad. Nosotros queríamos... Eh, desde el Instituto Simón Bolívar, como bien lo decía la compañera Michelle, en primer lugar disculpar eh, la ausencia del compañero Carlos Ron, el presidente del Instituto Simón Bolívar, que está atendiendo una situación familiar, eh, pero que bueno, está, ha estado muy pendiente de eh, conocer sobre todo de las impresiones que tiene la brigada y de lo que está compartiendo en cada uno de sus espacios. Es una brigada que se constituyó con compañeras y compañeros eh, de distintos espacios, muy diversa, muy nutrida, que también ha sido una experiencia muy interesante para el Instituto Simón Bolívar recibirlas y para toda la experiencia que estuvieron compartiendo con el poder popular en Venezuela. Eh, uno de los ejes fundamentales de la, digamos, de la caracterización del momento que vive Venezuela, que, que es 
muy importante para nosotros es, es tener este espacio para, para compartir, más allá de, de, de nuestras fronteras, esta situación y esta realidad de Venezuela ha sido lo que, lo que ubica a Venezuela en el centro y en el epicentro de los ataques del imperialismo estadounidense en una forma de agresión eh, que se ha vuelto, que se ha vuelto un, un instrumento de agresión contra los pueblos, que ha sido lo que se denomina la guerra de cuarta generación o la guerra no convencional o guerra híbrida, que en este, en este momento, bueno, que nosotros tenemos eh, que decir en primer lugar que la revolución bolivariana, este proceso que se lleva a cabo en Venezuela, este proceso democrático, participativo y protagónico, desde el triunfo del comandante Chávez en 1999, ha sido una revolución asediada, perseguida, por los enemigos del pueblo venezolano, por los enemigos de la soberanía y de la ruta que nosotros como pueblo nos hemos trazado. Eh, esto quiere decir que gracias a ese ataque y a esa agresión constante, el pueblo venezolano siempre ha vivido en una dimensión de, de lucha, de lucha, de lucha por, por nuestra soberanía fundamentalmente y de lucha por la, nuestra autodeterminación. Ahora bien, esta forma de agresión contra el pueblo venezolano se recrudeció a, a, a porcentajes inimaginables con la partida física de nuestro comandante Chávez en el año 2013 eh, y a partir de ese momento los enemigos de la revolución los que quieren apropiarse de las riquezas que hay en este país que, que no son pocas ser parte de las grandes reservas de petróleo del mundo es una cosa que nos pone en el epicentro de, la, de, la, de los ataques y de esta agresión y que a partir de esa forma, a, a partir de ese momento que, que el imperialismo consideró un momento fundamental para ya conseguir sus objetivos históricos, que no son otros que retomar su hegemonía dentro de, este, dentro, de esta, dentro, de este, dentro de esta parte del continente que ellos consideran su patio trasero, su, patio trasero, su, su, su que se consideran de verdad eh, dueños de esto, bajo su doctrina Monroe y todo este tema del anexionismo, eh, esta, esta guerra recrudeció en este tiempo y hemos vivido como pueblo, eh, bueno, un, una serie de ataques porque una de las características fundamentales de la guerra híbrida ha sido sin duda que es una guerra multidimensional, es una guerra que de buenas a primeras no podemos ver o no podemos descifrar quién es el que nos está agrediendo, pero sin duda eh, no, ha, no, no ha habido, no ha habido duda dentro de lo que decía dentro de lo que decía David de cómo ha sido el, la concientización y la politización del pueblo venezolano siempre ha estado muy presente que quien nos agrede es el imperialismo estadounidense y sus gobiernos satélites en el mundo, en este caso los gobiernos europeos y todo esto que se han prestado para la aplicación de esta guerra esta guerra ha tenido unas características que fundamentalmente ha avanzado a partir de la guerra económica, lo que se denomina la guerra económica lo que nos advertía incluso el comandante Chávez hace muchos años y que en esos tiempos muchas partes de nosotros no entendíamos muy bien a qué se refería el comandante Chávez con la, con, cuando avisoraba una guerra económica contra el país y que luego lo fuimos entendiendo mucho mejor con la aplicación de las medidas coercitivas unilaterales que ha sido una principal punta de lanza de esta guerra económica. La guerra económica ha venido a golpear directamente la moneda nacional, el Bolívar, ha venido a... Eh, generar una hiperinflación en los precios, porque ha sido además una, una guerra orquestada con lo que se denominan los sectores económicos eh, más fuertes en este país, lo que se llama la burguesía nacional, que siempre ha estado además al servicio de los intereses foráneos, de los intereses imperialistas, y eso ocasionó por supuesto un gran, una gran crisis dentro de la, dentro de la realidad nacional, puesto que la revolución bolivariana, compañeras y compañeros, si hay algo que se caracteriza es en ser un proceso que nos permitió a las grandes mayorías del pueblo venezolano, a las grandes mayorías de la clase trabajadora, de los sectores más vulnerables, de los sectores más pobres, de las mujeres, de las personas con alguna discapacidad, de los indígenas, de las, de las personas afrodescendientes, nos permitió avanzar en materia de derechos y en el acceso a lo que se denomina la justicia social. O sea, nosotros entendimos cómo era la justicia social a partir de de la revolución bolivariana cuando nos tocó directamente en, en primera persona a cada una de nuestras familias, a cada uno de nuestros hogares la, 
eh, esto de ser un país petrolero, cómo es que somos un país petrolero y cómo gozábamos de los, de la, de los beneficios de ser un país eh, con una riqueza en el marco de, de ser una, un país explotador del petróleo. Esto, estos grandes beneficios, estos grandes logros que la revolución eh, logró obtener en muy poco tiempo, en, los, en la primera década de esta revolución bolivariana, de este proceso revolucionario, han sido los, 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 los objetivos de ataque fundamental de esta forma de agresión contra el pueblo venezolano. Nosotros queremos aprovechar este espacio que, que nos brinda a ustedes, gracias a la solidaridad que los mueve al internacionalismo, que ha sido una de las cosas, eh, una de las enseñanzas más grandes de la brigada y del intercambio que han tenido con el pueblo venezolano, que ha sido precisamente poder avanzar en, en conocer más cómo es que estas, estas medidas coercitivas unilaterales que el gobierno de los Estados Unidos denomina sanciones, arbitrariamente lo denomina sanciones, han venido a causar graves psicológicas en el pueblo venezolano porque esta es una forma de guerra que está muy cerca de, la, de lo que es el concepto que tiene la propia Organización de Naciones Unidas que dice que, eh, que habla de, de que donde nosotros nos posicionamos en denunciar estas medidas coercitivas unilaterales como un verdadero genocidio contra el pueblo venezolano. Porque la, la expresión de esta guerra, lo más concreto de esta guerra, ha sido implosionar la realidad nacional para lograr su objetivo. Los objetivos que tiene una guerra convencional, una invasión directa, que ha sido eh, desmontar o, o despojar del poder político a, al gobierno legítimo constitucional y hacerse, por supuesto, de todas estas riquezas y hacerse de la soberanía nacional. En este sentido, compañeras y compañeros, eh, ha sido una, una importantísima eh, respuesta del pueblo venezolano gracias a uno de los principales legados. Nosotros siempre decimos que bueno, Hugo Chávez dejó un legado impresionante para, para nuestro pueblo, y no solamente para nuestro pueblo, sino para los pueblos del mundo, demostrando que la ruta al socialismo es posible, aún después de, lo, de los derroteros, de, de décadas pasadas que decían que ya no se podía hablar más de socialismo, pero que esa ruta que nos enseñó el comandante Chávez tiene un, unos principios, unos valores centrales que están asociados a la democracia participativa y protagónica. Una de las principales herramientas, uno de los principales legados del comandante Chávez ha sido esta democracia participativa y protagónica que fue siempre una... estuvo presente siempre en todo, los, en todo el proceso, incluso desde la campaña presidencial del comandante Chávez hasta los primeros decretos presidenciales, las primeras medidas, las primeras eh, políticas públicas que creó el comandante Chávez y que fueron generando los espacios para poder construir un, una ruta concreta hacia el socialismo bolivariano y feminista que nos hemos planteado en Venezuela. Esta ruta concreta ha sido eh, la democracia participativa y protagónica que tuvo expresión en, primer, en un primer tiempo de la revolución bolivariana en las formas de autogobierno que, la, que las comunidades organizadas, que el pueblo organizado, que el poder popular se dio a, a organizar, y luego que eso nació, como decimos acá, de hecho, o sea, que, que de hecho existían esos procesos de autogestión, de autoorganización y autorreferencia del poder popular en el territorio, luego, a partir del año 2007, la Revolución Bolivariana reconoce esa forma de organización territorial y empieza un reconocimiento del poder popular en una legislación nacional, como lo es la ley de los consejos comunales. A partir de ese proceso, compañeras y compañeros, buena parte de lo que ha sido la contención de esta agresión imperialista, la forma de organización popular, la forma de concientización de este pueblo en Venezuela viene dado porque existió existe un gobierno revolucionario que aunque se mueve dentro de un Estado que heredamos, como bien lo, lo caracterizó Chávez, un Estado burgués capitalista que heredamos de la colonia que tenemos, que, que sus estructuras a veces no son, eh, eh, digamos, eh, tienden a, a, a tener vicios de burocratismo, vicios de corrupción, a pesar de que nos movemos dentro de esa, dentro de esa estructura, 
el comandante Chávez y hoy el presidente Nicolás Maduro han sabido orientar la organización de una construcción de un Estado comunal que es la ruta y es el objetivo y es, la, y es el horizonte estratégico que la revolución bolivariana se ha planteado. Porque no es solamente decir vamos hacia el socialismo, sino que hay que saber que la construcción del socialismo tiene que tener un método de construcción revolucionaria, tiene que tener un, un, un aterrizaje de lo que vamos a construir y tiene que tener eh, las, el pueblo, tiene que tener el protagonismo en el pueblo para poder avanzar hacia, esa, hacia ese objetivo estratégico, hacia ese horizonte estratégico. Entonces, eh, ha sido... Una, un, un llamado a construir un Estado eh, nuevo, un Estado socialista y comunal, eh, en una lucha constante dentro de un mar de contradicciones que también nos, nos deja esta, esta, esta forma de organización que heredamos. Entonces aquí lo que los compañeros y las compañeras de la, de la brigada tuvieron la oportunidad de conocer fue parte de estos debates centrales que tiene el pueblo venezolano para superar la lógica capitalista, la lógica eh, neoliberal que, que, que es hegemónica en el mundo y para construir una ruta donde el, el pueblo es el protagonista, pero además eh, la forma colectiva, la salida de organización colectiva es una, es una realidad en Venezuela. O sea, muchos de los compañeros y las compañeras de la brigada cuando dábamos los debates nos decían, bueno, pero ¿cómo...? Cómo, ¿Cómo se logra este, esta, esta, esta avanzada? ¿Cómo hicieron para, para poder este, contener esta agresión imperialista, sobre todo en los últimos años, que ha sido muy grave, muy fuerte? Y siempre la respuesta ha sido desde, desde una mirada colectiva, desde una mirada eh, que aquí no se trata del sálvese quien pueda, de que cada quien puede resolver su vida desde, la, desde su realidad individual y particular. Aquí se trata de que la salida siempre va a ser en lo colectivo, en lo comunal, en lo territorial, y reconociéndonos como pueblo, su, eh, reconociéndonos además que lo que hemos hecho para sostener esta revolución y esta ruta ha sido eh, de verdad una hazaña histórica del pueblo venezolano y que merece ser reconocida más allá de, los, de, lo, de toda, la, de toda el, la intencionalidad que hay de aislar al proceso venezolano, de que no se conozca en el mundo lo que pasa aquí y de nuestra realidad. Aquí hay una realidad que nos invita, además a luchar, que además nos plantea una, una digámoslo así, una esperanza, para, no solamente para el pueblo venezolano, sino para los pueblos del mundo, de que es posible con mucha lucha, con mucha conciencia y con mucha organización, con mucha formación, con mucha politización, es posible superar y contener y superar, este, porque ya, como ustedes también lo vieron, compañeras, compañeros, este, ya muchas de las rutinas y de las dinámicas de las comunas, de los consejos comunales, no solamente están asociadas a la resistencia, también están asociadas a la ofensiva revolucionaria, a la forma de plantear eh, rutas concretas, de, de, de dejar atrás la dependencia que nos legó el, el capitalismo y superarla. Entonces, hay... Eh, hay un contexto de guerra, de amenaza permanente. Nosotros hemos, hemos llamado que estamos en el marco de una guerra híbrida, no convencional, pero nunca ha dejado de estar latente la, la ruta y la vía de una guerra convencional, de una invasión directa. Eso es una amenaza que siempre está latente sobre, la, sobre el pueblo venezolano. Mientras que el imperialismo actúe como actúa, siempre va a estar esa amenaza presente. Aquí hay un pueblo que responde a esa amenaza y lo hace con un gobierno que también responde a los intereses del pueblo venezolano, un gobierno de corte popular, un gobierno que entiende que no es por la ruta de arrodillarse al imperialismo estadounidense y a su lógica económica y neoliberal que vamos a superar y vamos a lograr conquistar nuestra, nuestra real y definitiva independencia, sino que sabe que la ruta tiene que seguir siendo lo que heredamos de, nuestros, de nuestra historia de lucha, de resistencia, seguir y continuar resistiendo, pero también seguir demostrando que hay un modelo concreto en Venezuela para construir el socialismo y que eh, no olvidamos, compañeras y compañeros, que eh, los embates de esta guerra han dejado en nuestro país profundas heridas. Esta guerra que impulsa el imperialismo estadounidense 
ha causado estragos en la vida del pueblo venezolano, ha causado dolor, sufrimiento. Vemos eh, cómo incluso buena parte de nuestros avances concretos en materia de derechos humanos han sido brutalmente agredidos por esta forma de guerra. Y esto, esto se ha expresado, compañeras, incluso más o sea, en el tema económico, que es la, la base fundamental eh, de esta guerra híbrida y de esta guerra económica, se ha expresado en buscar la manera de hacer eh, de verdad eh, quebrar la, la economía y con esto quebrar la moral, quebrar la voluntad del pueblo venezolano, y sin embargo, esos objetivos no los han podido alcanzar. O sea, que hay un pueblo que sigue en resistencia y que eh, está ahorita en un proceso que el presidente Nicolás Maduro denomina un proceso de recuperación, una ruta de recuperación de esta, de esta gran eh, a, agresión que hubo, sobre todo en los años 2016, 2017, 2018, donde el acceso a los, a los bienes de, de consumo, a los bienes de servicio, a los, a, los, a los medicamentos, a los alimentos, fue de verdad una lucha constante del pueblo venezolano. Este tiempo no es el tiempo de ahora, sin embargo la situación no, no ha sido del todo superada. Entonces aquí el tema de la solidaridad sigue latente y yo ya para cerrar, que me entendí mucho, eh, queríamos decirles que esta ruta de la solidaridad, sobre todo esta, este hermanamiento con el pueblo de los Estados Unidos, es una, es una ruta que para nosotros es muy importante y fundamental en el pueblo venezolano. Se aprecia muchísimo acá todas las acciones que desde el pueblo, desde el pueblo trabajador de los Estados Unidos se hace para la solidaridad y el internacionalismo, no solamente con el pueblo venezolano, sino con todos los pueblos que luchan y que padecen los embates del imperialismo. Nosotros reconocemos en ustedes, compañeras y compañeros, la valentía, el coraje, el heroísmo de levantar la voz incluso en esos, en esos espacios tan hostiles para la democracia, para los derechos humanos y para todo lo que nosotros, para nosotros es, es una realidad de la cotidianidad, a veces allá es tan difícil. Entonces, queremos que ustedes cuenten con nosotras y nosotros siempre para continuar con esta ruta del fortalecimiento, del hermanamiento de nuestros pueblos. Sabemos que también llegará, un día, llegará el día en que los Estados Unidos pueda avanzar en esa ruta de la revolución, de la revolución proletaria, de la revolución de las trabajadoras y los trabajadores, y aquí eh, el mayor aporte que podemos hacer a que eso se concrete en los Estados Unidos es continuar resistiendo y venciendo desde Venezuela. Muchísimas gracias por el espacio. Thank you so much. Gracias, mil gracias, Laura. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and all this inspires uh, us to, you know, continue in our fight. Um, and now I am very thrilled to introduce our next guest because he will, we will learn from him exactly what, what Laura is saying. Venezuelans are not on their knees. They are resisting the brutal and cruel effects of, of sanctions in this hybrid war with creativity and strength and hope of a better future. The communes in Venezuela have played a pivotal role in providing not only food, um, but it's the power of organizing that has kept like this moral, uh, high moral in Vene to Venezuelans, right? So I'm going to introduce Carlos David Vargas. He is a dedicated and passionate communard Uh, who is responsible for the international relations of the Communar Union, La Unión Comunera. Uh, he's a national, uh, which is a national uh, movement of the communes that raises the banners of anti-imperialist struggle, communal feminism, environmentalism, and the communal state. We are honored to have uh, Carlos Vargas with us today, and we are excited to hear uh, about his experience as a Communar in Venezuela. Carlos David, bienvenido. Uh, I'm going to ask my my first questions would be like, how how would you define communes? Um, what is the concept and what are you trying to achieve? So, ¿qué es para ti la, el concepto de la Unión Comunera? ¿Qué es ese concepto y qué, estás tratando de, qué están tratando de lograr las comunas en Venezuela? Hola, muy buenas noches. Hello. Good evening. I want to greet you and thank you. Thank all of you for this, for your solidarity, for your commitment, 
Venezuela and its revolution. For us, it's very pleasant to be able to share with the people of the United States and its popular organizations who, despite all the difficulties implied by being an activist, a militant activist in the United States, you came anyway and you strengthened our ties with uh, a sibling people, the Venezuelan people. We're part of a national organization, which we have called the Communard Union. We began in 2018 with a perspective of refounding the communal movement. Years ago, when with Commander Chavez, building a commune was very different. Well, and today, with, with a multifactorial aggression, multidimensional aggression by the United States, with its blockade and its sanctions, we are in a totally different situation that implies recreating or rethinking the commune from a different way than what we were doing 10 years ago. Today, the commune has positioned itself as a type of self-government within territories, as a possibility for building socialism from the territory, from territories themselves, from the ground up, from below to above. Building socialism from the top, as Chavez said, is nothing without the, the strength of the people, and the people are the only people capable through their organization by raising consciousness and being able to, to transform relations within territories, whether it's production or commerce or life, all the all these relations. So for us, the commune is a space of self-government, of real people, of, excuse me, of real power held by the people that has the capacity to mobilize poder transformar esta realidad. La comuna pretende para nosotros y, y el objetivo estratégico y fundamental, la comuna pretende en ese concepto bolivariano de construir Sorry, la felicidad it. social. Nos decía So it's a Bolivarian concept of building social happiness. As Minister Arriaza said, living in a commune, the people who live in communes are happier, and that's true. The people who are organized were the people who live in a commune, they face the, the attacks by U.S. imperialism and they respond to them in a wiser way and they might have positive responses to the crises. So for us, it's not the same facing U.S. aggression from the territories in a disorganized way than doing it rather from a communal space where we have people who engage in solidarity and we find collective ways to overcome and face reality. So, so going back to this issue of social happiness, social well-being, which is in our constitution, these are fundamental elements for building socialism. So how do we put this into practice? And how do we use this important concept and put it into a practical or concrete form for our people? Because in this scenario of warfare, where we've been attacked and a great percentage of the population has become depoliticized, so for us, it's important to win them over again, to win their hearts over again to the proje communal project and to do it in practice as well, to show that communal life in socialism is a fact is a, and is, is something that is being successful within our territories. So the commune is really a, a current thing in, in Venezuela and it has force and effectiveness in Venezuela. Communes have positioned themselves again as a concrete possibility for transforming our, our capitalist system and the state as well. So that is, we've done a qualitative leap 
in order to position the communal project. And now we have a lot of strength in the national panorama. And under this framework, under this, especially under this framework of aggression. What is the Unión Comunera? What's that, uh, what role does it have uh, in achieving the, the objectives of the communal project? ¿Cuál es, ¿Qué es la Unión Comunera y cuál es, eh, cómo logran los objetivos del proyecto comunal? Mira, la, un, la Unión... The Communal Union is a political organization at a national level of the communes. That's how we define it in our statutes and in our uh, program of the union. It's a political organization, a national political organization of communes that is aimed at unifying the experiences, especially the most significant experiences of those who have resisted. Our goal is to join, unify all the communes. But so right now, we are looking for these experiences of resistance that in the face of the blockade have had a her heroic and creative response and that have maintained the, the experience of the communal movement, such as the El Maizal commune, Che Guevara commune, the Cinco Fortalezas or Five Strengths commune, different experiences throughout the country that during these year, many years of crisis, of, of lots of difficulties, have creatively achieved to be able to sustain and further the communal movement. So our concern was that these experiences were isolated they were acting on a local level, and it was necessary that communes see themselves, as Commander Chavez said, in a, a great national system, because it's impossible for us to build socialism in a small enclosed space in a commune. We have to have a vision and a characteristic that's national. So we convened all of these experiences of resistance to build a national organization that proposed a goal of a great confederation of communes articulated by our own experiences of people's power. So what we've been unifying experiences of production, of training, of, the, of experiences led by the working class and, and, and of, of, of people leading the housing struggle. So different experiences of what we have called the great leap of the commune, the great leap of the commune art union. So we have convened these experiences, 70 of them in this first phase, that we believe have been fundamental, extremely important, because during these years of crisis, so that we wouldn't lose the communal experience during these years of crisis. And today, we have been able to remoralize the political force, the Chavista political and po popular political forces. Without these experiences, well, it would have been extremely hard to be able to rebuild the people's movement these years. We are in a process of re rebuilding the popular forces that were very tired or worn down and, and had lost capabilities because of the aggression, because of the crises, because of the pandemic, everything that we faced. So these experiences were weakened. And, but we have those experiences that resisted and they may have been isolated, they may have felt economic difficulties and they have, but the people resisted there. And today, those experiences that we visit, that we visited, where we debated the construction of the platform with, they were significantly important in having a strong communal movement that's able to move and mobilize and organize, that is constantly discussing politics, that is constantly discussing proposals to overcome our realities and improve them, that it is constantly articulating and coming up with new things as part of its struggle. And today we were one of the primary forces of organization at a national level. 
Do we have things yet outstanding? Yes, we have to incorporate more communes. There's lots of other experiences that could join us. But today, we can say that we are one of the primary uh, examples of popular organization in the country. And as a strategy, we have built we built a strategy to strengthen the commune and the communal projects. So we created a national system of training, for example, uh, that has built training schools in every commune, that has built a national training program. And today where we have training teams in every region. So that's very important. And with them, we've designed a plan and that plan is ongoing. Next week, actually, we have a, a course for communal leaders. That's very important. And we've developed these courses for communal leaders. We've got courses in communication we, and in, in popular feminism and different types of courses in order to politicize our cadres. Another important course is the grassroots, working with the grassroots because we've lost a bit of that. And some of our lead, the leaders in the communities don't work with the bases, don't work with the grassroots. So we're working on a, a course to give them tools to be able to work with the grassroots. And we've also created an economic system with the union, which is just starting and we have a lot to do there. But today we have unified experiences in the production of coffee, sugarcane, corn, beef, different ex experiences that have been adding on and be able to able to build economic circuits or economic zones to aggregate the communal movement based on uh, on an economic basis. And that way to, to be able to add to, to encourage or foster a national communal economy. So we have different strategies in terms of building the community communal uh, communal union from a communication strategy to security and in this context it's it's very difficult to do, engage in politics with others sometimes we have to have big discussions with others to, to how to do it so for example we have a big debate with the youth within the union because we have to incorporate the youth that maybe don't identify with the communal political project or with the revolutionary project. So what do we do to have these sectors incorporate into us? So we're working on this issue of communications, agroecology, and we have this discussion for these big sectors that might not really be aligned with us. We, we're working on having them incorporate in creative ways to join us in this struggle for socialism in creative ways. Thank you so much, uh, Carlos. Uh, David, I'll let you. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Carlos, for that. Um, this is a better understanding of the commune system and, and the work it's doing. I wanted to introduce uh, next uh, speaker is Adrian Pine who's one of the co-organizers of this Kevin Zeese Brigade, is a medical anthropologist who teaches Department of teaches in the Department of Anthropology and Social Change at the California Institute of Integral Studies. Her work centers on U.S. imperialism, neoliberal fascism, and international solidarity, as well as uh, uh, immigration issues. Um, Adrian uh, is going to talk about um, what we actually did on the in the delegation in a little more detail. Adrian, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. Um, I'm going to share my screen so everybody can see my little PowerPoint because I um, get the exciting task of doing the slideshow <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and just uh, telling everybody how incredibly exciting this was because this was um, so our Kevin Z's Brigade there. I hope that that is um, visible to everybody. And I just 
erase all my notes by making it full screen. So I'm just gonna talk off the top of my head. I hope that's okay. Um, this was the first time that we did anything like this and it was really an incredible experience. We were lucky to have delegates from just an incredible variety of backgrounds with so much experience representing many, many organizations um, that are that are not pictured here in the logos um, that we only have the, but um, but the, the logos here are the, are the main sponsoring organizations. So the Simon Bolivar Institute, which we, we just, we were so grateful to them for all of the support that they gave us throughout for the, um, uh, for for the attaches, for the interpretation, for um, for everything. The obviously the Union Comunera, um, and then Code Pink and Task Force on the Americas um, on the U.S. side. Um, so uh, so I'm just gonna. Normally I'd be giving analysis. I'm just gonna do a slideshow right now and gonna try to keep it as quick as possible so that um, so that our main speakers can go at it. So I'm just gonna talk about what we did. Um, and let's see, uh, there we go. Um, we stayed at the Escuela, the first few days and the last few days, we stayed at the Escuela Nacional Robinsoniana in Caracas, which is just this amazing project. Um, it's a, it's this large campus right in the urban um, area of Katia. We were able to meet with many different um, people there. This um, from left to right. This is um, Minister Jorge Arriaza and, and Carlos Ron, who, um, who we were hoping to have here today. Um, but we're so glad to have Laura because, in fact, she was um, the one who accompanied us through um, through much of much of this whole experience. Um, Jorge Arriaza is the minister, um, the government minister for the communes and popular power and. Um, and it, it really gave us, it was a really interesting lesson to learn how interconnected the government and the unions are, to, to learn how, um, how they work together, even though they're coming from different areas. Second picture is Carlos David, who we just heard from, um, as well as other members, leaders of the Union Comunera. In the third picture, um, what we're hearing from uh, members of the Frente Francisco de Miranda, um, which is an incredible political movement that actually runs the National Robinsonian School um, and creates this space for all sorts of educational um, projects and workshops. We um, we stayed in a in a dorm room there as well. It was really um, a, an incredible space. Um, and then the final uh, photo here is the folks from Venezuela Analysis. And so it was a really interesting and rounded group or, or I think different speakers that we got to hear from and and really informative because some of them didn't agree with each other. And it, I think we, it was great to hear um, all sorts of perspectives. Um, and so that was an incredible space. While we were staying there, we were visiting the Comuna El Panal, which is the beehive commune. And this is Laura, who you just heard from with, uh, I think that's Anacona, right? With a, um, with a Code Pink t-shirt on. And um, and this is us at the very end with uh, lots of members from the commune. The Alpana commune is just an incredible space of urban struggle and resistance and hope. Um, we heard first from Robert Longa, who's one of the main organizers. He runs the radio there and they have all sorts of other productive projects like Carlos David was talking about. Um, this is the pool. I just included this here as an anecdote that during COVID, they took the pool they filled it with like regular water and just put a bunch of tilapia in there and used it as a way to not go hungry because of the combination of the blockade and the pandemic. Um, so just incredibly inventive and creative. They were cleaning it out at this point um, to turn it back into a pool. Um, these were some of the projects that we were um, that we were involved in when we were there. One of the exciting things about the brigade, um, and that was very intentional on part on the part of all the sponsoring organizations, was to ensure that this wasn't a volunteerist trip or um, or a sort of poverty tourism. That rather this was real solidarity work. Um, and we did our best to make that the case. Um, so we actually got um, 
our hands dirty. This first picture on the left was the, the communes each designated projects that um, that they wanted us to support them with. So on the left, this is going to be a communal bank that the El Panal is creating to help them with their community finances. On the right, um, it's where they were going to put in a community laundromat for so that people would have be, it would be more easier for folks to uh, clean their clothes. And so we worked on cleaning these spaces out. We also painted the school because the semester was about to start um, and really uh, got a sense of the kind of work um, that people do and the way that they interact. It was really inspirational. Um, this here is uh, one of the things that we found is that um, the program Barrio Adentro, which was the um, program started by Chavez bringing in Cuban doctors to the same kind of marginalized areas that um, communes really flourish in, is still alive and well, but it's staffed with Venezuelan doctors. And so this is one of the one of the little um, clinics. I think they're hexagonal, um, but people were you know really dedicated to the Chavista model even during the um, the 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 crisis of the sanctions, right? That there's there are, there's less supplies, but um, and so one example of that is the Club de Abuelas that came and gave us a presentation at um, at the closing ceremony of El Panal uh, when we were leaving El Panal, and Club de Abuelas is something that's brought in from the Cuban model that was brought in with Barrio Adentro, and they were so fun. They did dances, they sang, um, and uh, and so we really got a sense of. I, I think the joy in communal life and the sort of sense of togetherness. Um, we then traveled seven hours and 13 minutes to approximately uh, from Caracas, which is the starting point on this little map here, um, all the way to Cumanacoa in, um, in Estado de Sucre. Um, and that was where we were going to the uh, Cinco Fortalezas commune. This was a very different kind of commune because it was in a very rural area, agricultural. Um, the main industrial production that they had there was um, was in sugarcane. This is traditionally what's been grown there. But what was really fascinating was that um, in the commune, they had been in this struggle against a private um, sugar mill owner who had stolen a whole year, an entire year's crop of the whole town. This had been devastating for the economy of the commune and of everybody and else in the town who had contributed. And what they managed to do with the government's help was actually set up their own sugarcane mill. So we'll see that in a second, but that's part of the project that we did was, was supporting them with that. We ate the best food there. It was mostly vegetarian. It was so good. It was all incredibly, it was local and fresh. Um, the, the flags here that you see are representing all the different organizations, including um, the, the landless workers movement from Brazil that were present while we were there. Um, and let's see, so, um, so, uh, delegation members worked together with members of the community, um, one of the mornings on, um, putting, uh, on clearing the land for the, um, Mandala, which is a sacred space in the community that had um, gotten blown down um, from a windstorm. And so they're here working with a group of women who were also part of the community kitchen and part of the feminist movement there. One of the things we learned about was called the Ruta de las Flores, which is, um, a, is a sort of a project that feminists have. And we just learned a tremendous amount. I'm sure the other speakers can talk about um, the really important protagonism of feminist commune leaders like the leaders of Comuna Cinco Fortalezas in facing the very gendered impacts of the sanctions. Um, so here's the sugar cane that they were rebuilding. The government donated all of that um, roofing that's there so they'd be able to run. And you can see this is like what, what the sugar looks like when it's um, when they've ground it up and it's pouring out. It, um, it's a uh, and then, and then this is the finished product, which is a, um, uh, what is it called again? Papelon. Um, <laughs> it, it, uh, it's like a, a sort of molasses-y delicious thing. And you can see it says Echo en Comuna, they're made in commune. Um, from there, we went to Comuna Ezequiel Zamora in the city of Barcelona, which is the capital of the state of Anzuategui. It's about halfway back from Sucre. Um, 
this was the first picture here is when we were arriving kind of uh it was already dark and we just got the most generous incredible reception um the two women here are our identical twins in fact <laughs> if in case you're noticing a similarity um just such generosity um the let's see i don't know i think it was the next day we went to the factory that the Comuna Ezequiel Zamora runs collectively with, sorry, my dog is eating something across the table, um, runs collectively with uh, two other communes, the Comuna Cacique Guayquepuro and Comuna Luisa Cáceres de Arismendi, all of which are, you know, in poor urban neighborhoods right nearby surrounding this factory, which had been abandoned um by its owners and they took it over and with the support of the state and crucially with the support of the ministry of eco-socialism and i just love that there's a ministry of eco-socialism um they have been able to um, make the factory productive again and it's just been an, a boon for the communities the factory is of uh, mayas and uh, so it's nets and nails, and then they added plastic recycling. And so the, they're doing all of the plastic, they're recycling all the plastic from the three communities. And that has been enough to create incredible, um, to, uh, it's, it's had them working full time. They're creating these products. And this was some of the work that we did here. You can see we've got this massive bag of plastic bottles and we're separating them out into their component parts so they can be recycled. Um, this picture on the left shows the different kinds of plastic that go into making um, plastic wood, uh, which um, goes into this machine here that you see and turns into these beams that make things like this uh, playground sculpture. So it was really exciting to see um, and be part of this incredible work that they're doing. We also got to go to amazing cultural experiences everywhere we went. This was a dance um, performance and um, and uh, that, that we had in, at that site. Back in Caracas, um, we got a quick visit to the Comuna La Minta, which is another urban commune. They have a, a pastry store as their sort of profit making activity. So that's what you see on the left. On the right, this is an abandoned property that they took over and turned into a farm. There's all kinds of fruit trees and vegetables and medicinal trees. And then there's like chickens and, and rabbits in the back. So uh, it's, it's, this is supporting all the community and they also ensured that the, the food was the monthly, uh, I, the, the government distributed food, that was a site for government distributed food. Um, they had creative spaces. Here you can see there's capoeira and an incredible poetry dance performance that we got to witness. And then finally on the last or the second to last day, we had the privilege of getting to meet Camila um, Fabri de Saab at the Ciudad Caribia, which the movement, the Free Alex Saab movement has um, a strong connection with and has created a community kitchen there. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it was an incredible experience. We hope that some of you who are listening will join us next time around. Um, and, uh, and I just wanted to use this to give folks a sense of really how inspirational and exciting it was to see all of the work that these communes are doing um, despite the, the, the the horrible and shameful impact of the unilateral coercive measures. So uh, that's me, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, uh, Adrian. And I, I'm gonna go a little bit quick quick here because we, we, has, we have uh, extended a little bit. Um, I'm going to now introduce Selena. Selena de la Croce is the Publications Re Director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. If you don't know, please go and check them out. They're amazing. Uh, he's a co-founder and steering committee member of the Anti-Imperialist Action Committee in Western Massachusetts and a longtime organizer and activist. Selena was in the delegation uh, with uh, the other uh, 14 members. And yeah, my, my question is, what is the work uh, being developed in the three communes that you visited? 
And uh, what was your experience there like? What social programs did, did you come across that demonstrated the innovation in meeting the needs of the community, particularly in the areas of healthcare, education, and housing? Thanks, Michelle. Um, and thank you so much to the other speakers. I feel like so much has been covered and we could we could go on forever, but I'll be disciplined in time so that I don't. Um, so I, I thought that I would maybe focus on one of the communes we visited just in the interest of time. And hopefully everyone will be going, be able to go on a future brigade and get to see the rest for themselves. Um, but actually, one of the questions that someone asked in the chat was on my mind in terms of just thinking about climate change and how that's kind of a big, uh, a big focus in the United States and actually came up quite a bit uh, on the trip. And in one of the um, communes in particular in Barcelona, which, as Adrian showed, is about four hours outside of Caracas. Um, so they, uh, Carlos David and other comrades kind of talked about what communes are in general. Um, but I thought that the example of what they've done there is particularly interesting because they, like communes do, set out to kind of resolve the most concrete and urgent issues in their community, despite the issues of uh, the, the challenges presented by the blockade and, and, and all the other challenges um, around that. So they, what their main, there's, they have something called an EPS, which is a, um, social production company enterprise uh, that kind of is the economic engine of the commune. And there's actually three communes that work together around that EPS, which takes um, recyclable plastics like soda bottles and different things and turns it into plastic wood, which is a construction material. And so Adrian showed some of the pictures of that, um, of what that actually looks like. And so they're kind of responding. One of the needs that they explained that they were responding to is that their uh, they, their community dealt with a lot of trash, which ends up being a public health issue. And also it's a public health issue where I live. There's a lot of trash where I live and people, I live in Western Massachusetts, there's a river and people get E. coli from it just because it's dirty and, you know, we don't clean up our, our own neighborhoods. And so it was kind of interesting to think about that parallel. parallel. But so they were addressing a concrete issue of having trash and, and plastics in their neighborhood. Um, and use that to make a to meet another need that they had, which is to build construction materials so that they can, like Adrian explained, build um, not only build like playgrounds for children in their own communities, fix uh, chairs and so on in schools that that uh, for chairs that were broken, um, but also can then sell those to generate funds that can fuel that can um, finance other projects. And so it was interesting, somebody in the chat asked about oil, but in the United States, I don't know, we talk about climate change and sustainability. And when we recycle, actually only 3% of the things that we put in our recycling bins goes to get recycled and 97% goes to landfills. And so it was interesting, like we have this kind of, I don't know, expectation about how things happen in the US and versus elsewhere. But I think it was actually interesting to see people collecting, not only like setting up co like uh, very well managed just collection systems for the for the recycling, but then actually processing it. We got to see them, like how they processed um, that material into into building blocks. Um, and so, um, yeah, that not only generates jobs for people who are working uh, who are working in the factory on the production, but also like produces additional funds for that they can, that the community can decide to um, spend on other things. And I, I don't know, one of the things that really stood out to me was that like in the United States, we have cooperatives, right? And so you have, uh, I don't know, people like a, a group of workers in a particular place who maybe decide that they're going to have control over their one workplace. But very often it, what that ends up meaning is that like those workers have better jobs. They have control over their working conditions because they're not, you know, and maybe they make more because the CEO isn't making off with all the profits, but it generally kind of like ends there. Not in every case, but it's a, a kind of general like context of communes or sorry, cooperatives in the United States. What was really interesting about the communes is that um, the workers also have control of the means of production of that particular thing. They also get to, you know, set, make collective decisions about how things are run, but then they have a much more kind of like integral view of what the community needs. And so if you have like children who aren't working in the factory, unlike in the United States, this particular moment, uh, or you have elderly people or sick people or women or people working or in other sectors, those people are, are like just as important and not just the workers of that particular factory, but they have these assemblies, which we actually, I got with a couple of other um, attendees of the brigade, got to attend one of the assemblies in one of the commune where people were talking about what the most burning issues is in a different commune, but what the most burning issues are for them. In some places it might be that there's, you know, there aren't enough light bulbs. And so it's can be dangerous at night because people can't see anything or there are no or 
um, education is a huge issue because of the blockade. Like they're not, the state isn't able to pay teachers um, the way that they were before, because the result of the blockade is that the economy went down by 99%. And so if you like, just like math wise, if you have a hundred dollars, they went from having a hundred dollars to $1. And obviously the Venezuelan economy has more than a hundred dollars, but just like to imagine the scale of that, that it nosedive, it went to 1% of what it was before. And so communes are coming up with these really creative ways and resilient ways of meeting the community's needs, but also like income, it's like the assemblies that decide. It's not just like the factory workers making plastics, but it's like, okay, well, this is how much money we were able to make because we produced X amount of playgrounds. So what are we gonna do with that? What's the most, what's like, what are the biggest issues here? And and the community decides that. And so it kind of like, not only, it like does what the cooperatives that we know do, but it also kind of breaks with um, the capitalist, capitalist logic of, of um, production. And they, on the wall, speaking of climate change and oil and all of that, there are these, there's this big portrait of Chavez and a big portrait of Maudo and something that reads, uh, that makes a reference to the fifth, I think it's the fifth uh, objective in the plan, plan de la Patria, which was a, like Homeland Plan, which was this kind of strategic outline of the Bolivarian Revolution, which talks about climate change. So we, I don't know, I won't, I won't do like a premature Q&A, but I just like was thinking like, what are the experiences that really like, I don't know, what do people ask about the most or what are some of the experience, like things that come up the most in conversation in the US and that just felt, um, I don't know, like a really... I don't know, indicative example of, of people not only being able to dem like dem democratically come up with the answers to their own solutions. Um, but yeah, and it is with, you know, like this uh, in each of the communes we went to, despite all kinds of contradictions that there are, like the tractor at Comunacoa um, that Adrian showed a picture of was purchased by the state because I think it costs like $40,000 or something like that. So there's always going to be tensions and nothing's ever perfect, but it's just like so, so different from anything that we know in the US. Like, you know, Biden, Biden is not going to come along to my neighborhood and be like, oh, you guys get E. coli because your river's dirty because there are no trash cans in your neighborhood. Like here, I got you. Like, it's just not going to happen. And so I think it's important to like think about the differences in context um, for what that means for people in the United States. Um, uh, some of the other things I don't know that stood out, like Adrian already talked about the Barrio Adentro program. We also saw like there was a, a dent, like a mobile dentist truck. So the and like those things work in tandem with each other. And so the communes often and not not every neighborhood in Venezuela is organized into a commune. I think on the books there are about three thousand communes in Venezuela, and not necessarily all all of them are active. But like like Carlos said before, like people who live in communes live better. Like people are able, like communes are able to kind of come up with these systems to to know their neighbors. Like in the U.S., we generally don't know our neighbors, right? Like people know their neighbors, or in some instances, kind of have done surveys of what are the needs that people have. Like we brought um, prenatal vitamins, for instance, and that people knew, oh well, we have this many pregnant women in our community, and so this is how we're going to distribute them. And then the doctor, who's you know a public employee, came to the community when we were in Cunaco, um in Cinco Fortalezas. And like looked at those things with us, and and you know, so there's this kind of like way that those um, that the knowledge that communes have and the organizing structure that they have kind of work together with missions that were set up by the state, despite how um, hard hit they've been by the blockade. Um, let's see. Um, I think something else that really stood out uh, to me is the sense of like. And just let's see, going back to Michelle's question, which was, um, yeah, I think something that really stood out to me was just like the sense of like dignity that people have that I don't think that we have in the United States in the same way. Like during, I remember actually Carlos and I were talking uh, during the brigade and my, during the course of the brigade, my neighbor got evicted. Um, because the, someone bought the building and they wanted to flip it and charge more rent. And I remember I was just being like, what do you mean? Like the neighbors didn't just like descend on, you know, and that was her choice, right? She, not to get into somebody's business, but like just the kind of the, the, this, like that here, especially in the communes, but like people have a sense of dignity that they're not just going to be rolled over, that they know what's possible, that they know that like that people deserve that deserve human rights, deserve fair housing and, and good quality housing and deserve any number of things that in the US, I think sometimes we just accept that we don't have because we're so beaten down and don't always have that organizing structure, even though we're, I think we are building it and the people on this call are building it. I think like being able to be here and see like how far advanced that is was really incredible. 
Um, and I think we have a lot to learn from comrades here. And I know Sachin's going to talk more about solidarity, but it's just like when we talk about like what Laura talked about having a, that there's a hybrid war. There's an economic blockade, which caused the economy to contract by 99%. There's a media blockade. There are all these things. But there's also a blockade on hope um, in the United States. Like that we, what is it? I'm stealing someone else's quote, but we're like more willing to accept the end of the world because it's being like flooded by polar ice caps than we are to accept the end of capitalism. And I think being able to come to Venezuela and being able to see what people are building despite these difficult conditions, despite everything. Like we had someone tell us how his mother died in his arms while he was from COVID, while he was going around to hospitals trying to get her care, but he couldn't get her care when the US was blocking COVID vaccines. I don't know the exact chronology, but the US prevented Venezuela from getting COVID vaccines. Um, during the blockade but people like are just extraordinarily resilient and like that's one of the leaders of the Unión Comunera it's not you know it's not somebody who then just says okay well this is how it is it's like okay this is you know people have suffered Laura mentioned Carlos mentioned people have suffered a lot but this isn't just the way that it is like people are organized and people are resilient and people have here have accomplished like really extraordinary things um and I'll wrap up Michelle and I'm, I'm at, at time but um, I think really extraordinary thing is that we have a lot to learn from. Um, and I hope everybody gets a chance to visit. Um, I don't know one thing. Yeah, I think, you know, we have a lot to build in the United States. And it's not just solidarity work because, um, because things are hard in Venezuela. But it's, you know, it's if, if we're going to live in a world in the United States where we're not all like at risk of getting evicted and living ch paycheck, pay paycheck or whatever it is, it's because we're going to be working with and learning from our comrades and in, in Venezuela and other places. So um, for the in the interest of time, I'll be disciplined and stop talking. But I hope I hope that inspires people to come and see for yourselves and kind of deconstruct some of the some of the false, fake news that we get about what's actually going on here. Wow. Thanks so much, Selena. It was very helpful, and there's always a lot to share, more to share, and uh, hopefully people can stay in touch and and learn more and participate in the future. I wanted to introduce. Um, Last main speaker is Sachin Pedala, who's a PhD student in economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's a member of the Anti-Imperialist uh, Action Committee, the Workers' Party of Massachusetts, and a collaborator with Progressive International. He does research on resource sovereignty in the global south with a focus on Venezuela. And um, I was thinking, hoping you could talk about so from your experiences in Venezuela, how does that transmit to um, making it relevant to the working class people in this country and how we can uh, make that experience um, of use to promote concrete actions of uh, lifting the sanctions here and in strengthening solidarity uh, with Venezuela? That's solidarity and, and not charity. So expand on any of that and uh, whatever you can share, Sachi. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being on here on a Friday evening um, and listening to these amazing speakers before me. Um, I think everybody has said a lot of really, really valuable and incredible things. Um, and I, in the interest of time, will try to keep to as as short a time as I can, uh, knowing that I'm long winded. Um, but yeah, I think um, so. Okay, so like Selena said, Venezuela's economy shrank by 99% over the span of like five years because of the sanctions. Uh, their foreign exchange and earnings in precise um, shrank from like $40 billion to around $700 million. And I think just hearing that and hearing about like how much damage that that's done in terms of like the statistics, I can I can read off a whole bunch of numbers that I won't, but um, I it's hard not to feel, I guess, guilty about what the government that I'm paying my taxes to is doing to a sovereign people who are choosing to do, to live their lives in a, in pursuit of self-determination, I guess. And what strikes me, I guess, the most, I guess, so going into this trip, I guess I had a bit of a charity ish mindset to get at David's question. Um, mm -hmm. And I think very quickly, I realized that people didn't need my charity. Like people were already running the communes with or without my input, with or without me advising people or like bringing my little suitcase of medicines, which were obviously very valuable. And I'm not saying that like solidarity kind of contributions are not appreciated and uh, obviously very essential parts of kind of the, the resistance to the blockade that we have to participate in. But I also think that 
more than kind of giving, it was about participating with the comuneros and the communes in the process of struggle that they're in. It was tilling the land in like 105 degree heat in Guanacoa with all the other comuneros to, so that they could sow the seeds that they were going to eventually eat. It was, you know, like taking baths with like in a bathroom without running water with a bunch of us sharing a house and it was somebody else's house that they had given to us and you make it work, you know? And it, I, th I think there's just so much to learn from Venezuela. To Selena's point, the, the dignity and the resilience that people have shown, um, I think is just incredible. Uh, people have really been creative in finding ways to make life work for their, them and their communities. And everything is done with the collective mindset. I think that's one of the biggest lessons I learned is that like every, I think in a, when you're truly a part of a collective body, when you're truly part of a collective movement, I think everything that you do has to be in pursuit of that collective vision. And Venezuela as communes really encapsulate that. I think there's just an incredible commitment to the collective good and people like young children. I literally saw like a 12 year old kid climb and his two friends climb a guava tree to like get like their shirts full of guavas so that like, other people could have fruit because it was hot. And it was just like, this is just ingrained in people. And I guess the the next point that I want to make is that um, the, the systems that Javis put in place are truly incredible and they continue to be incredible to this day. And Chavez sowed the seeds of truly remarkable things that are continuing to flourish well beyond he has passed. Um, just for some statistics. So Chavez from 1999 to 2011, 2013, um, slashed unemployment and poverty by half in Venezuela, uh, significantly reduced child and infant mortality. Um, he brought literacy virtually to 100%, I think it was like 96% by the time he died. So basically everybody, every adult could read and he tripled GDP per capita. So everybody was taking three times much, three times as much home when Chavez died compared to when he took office. It's hard not to like somebody who does all that for you, right? And you see that everywhere in Venezuela. Like you cannot go a single place in Venezuela, whether it's Caracas, whether it's Guanacoa, whether it's uh, Anzuategui, like you can't go anywhere without seeing a mural of Chavez and of Maduro and of Bolivar and just like all the spirit and the, the all these like really inspiring slogans next to their faces. And it's not just symbolic. It's not just about like a brainwashed sort of like reverence for this leader that people are all like, I don't know, not smart enough to understand that he's really an evil dictator. Like, it's not that at all. And I think it's very insulting that the US media thinks that we all think that it could be that simple. Um, but just seeing in person, like how much analysis people have behind um, kind of all that Chavez did and all that socialism has done for Venezuela and all that has happened from the ground roots up. It's not just about like this dictator coming in and like doing all these things for the people. It's about the, the this 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 president who was elected democratically and who uh, listened to the years of calls from his people to give them the right to housing, give them the right to health care, give them the right to a livable wage, to a dignity at work, and went out and fought for them and fought with them. And I think it's incredible to see just how much what a fire he lit in the communes that everybody is now participating in such a radical activity of collective self-governance. And I think there's so much to learn from just um, the fact that, I guess what's, what started the process of the communes really is Chavez's sort of uh, missions, which he instituted at the start of his presidency. Um, and uh, their missions on house, housing, healthcare, education, nutrition, all these things that Venezuelans, everybody needs. Um, and um, there was an explicit focus on getting these things to literally everybody in Venezuela. That's how you see like 100% literacy. That's how you see plummeting child mortality. That's how you see all these incredible things that Venezuela did. It's by going to the communities and doing things with them and giving them the resources that they need to flourish. And Chavez did that. The, the Bolivarian Revolution has done that. And I think it's all these statistics show that the Bolivarian Revolution has worked. Like it has improved the, Ven the Venezuelan people's lives so much and the sanctions have tried to destroy that. And it, I think the other point that I really want to stress, so I guess the the question remains like, why should we care about this as US citizens? I think um, it's 
it's a little bit like a story about another people and it's like, how do, how do they relate to me? But I guess let's think about this, right? So Venezuela institutes these programs for universal housing, universal healthcare, universal education, universal nutrition programs, these things that the U.S. very blatantly lacks, right? And the U.S.'s response to Venezuela doing all this is not to give its people, its own people, the same things, which every human deserves. Um, it is to try to coup. In 2002, the U.S. backed a coup against Chavez, which failed. Um, but it was an attempt to destroy these programs that he had sowed the seeds for, which he, which he knew and everybody knew were going to generate great benefits for the Venezuelan people, and which sure enough did. And in the wake of Chavez's death, we've just seen these the sanctions regime. There's 930 different sanctions against Venezuela's economy right now, which is just unfathomable. And that means Venezuela can't trade its oil, can't access its foreign deposits in banks. Like literally, it's just so hard to even buy things as the Venezuelan state. And in spite of that, there's so there's just an attitude of abundance among the communes because of just this. I don't know, this revolutionary spirit and optimism that everybody seems to have. But I guess going back to what I was saying, um, the the it's just so deeply ironic to me that the the US government is sanctioning Venezuela, which offers all its people these human rights that everybody deserves. And the US government does not offer its people these same things, even though it's fully feasible. And the US spends more on its military than the next 10 countries combined. And yet, somehow Venezuela is the authoritarian dictatorship, and the U.S. is the democracy. And I'm, I, it, it just blows. I think just seeing in real life just how much democracy really exists in Venezuela at the most grassroots level is truly incredible, and it's so inspiring. And I, I think, like this, the the edu like the 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 ability of political education and like public education of everybody, I think. Um, to to transform the the public consciousness and to transform the idea of what is possible is more magical, honestly. Like within a few years of Chavez starting this public education program, communes started popping up everywhere in Venezuela. And it was just like an organic thing that was happening. And it's just incredible to see that if you give people the services they need and you give them a real education, they will organize themselves very organically. And I think the same thing can be said about the US in a country that, like I said, lacks all these social services from the government that um, is depriving or trying to deprive Venezuelans of accessing from their own government. Um, I think it's important that as we engage in fights against, or rather fights for a livable wage, fights for housing for all, fights for healthcare for all, fights for um, a livable planet for everybody, um, food for everybody, you know, all these things that were engaged on the ground in the, in the United States. And I think it's really important to connect that to the fact that Venezuela has infrastructure to do all these things and has been doing all these things for its people. And they are an example for us, honestly, they are an example that we should turn to and look at and figure out what, like how to, how to, you know, exchange information with um, at a more effective level in order to really model the Bolivarian process because it is just remarkable. And we should basically, what I'm trying to say, because <laughs> I'm being long-winded, but basically what I'm trying to say is that there's so much we can learn from Venezuela and it's, I think, reducing it to charity and reducing it to like, I need to donate things to Venezuela so that they can survive instead of looking at, as, looking at it as like a, a solidarity process where we're learning from Venezuelans and we're also, you know, sharing the surplus that we have with people when we can and, and just seeing how much is possible when we organize and educate our communities, um, I think is really crucial. And I guess to that point, like I was starting to say, and then I got distracted, but um, the uh, connecting our struggles against social ills in the U.S. has to be connected to an anti-sanctions movement. And I think saying anti-sanctions is very nebulous and it's not very clear, um, but... Um, I think when we talk about the material impacts of not being able to fund those pharmacy trucks that go literally all over Venezuela, like in Anzuategui, there was a pharmacy truck that, or I'm sorry, a dentist truck. There's also pharmacy trucks, but this was a dentist truck that we saw and the dentist got out of their truck and literally with their backpacks of all their equipment, walked up a mountain for four hours to give everybody dental care. And that's just a thing that happens in Venezuela, but the U S is trying to stop that from happening. And so from that standpoint, we need to fight against what is happening with the U.S. government and its sanctions. 
Um, but I think in a larger sense, Venezuela has that infrastructure already. It's not like we need to go and save them and tell them how to do things because they, they, they know they're organizing themselves way better than we ever have. And we have so much to learn from them. And I guess with that, I will stop talking about Venezuela, but I do have one quick thing to say, which is three days from now, September 11th is the uh, anniversary of a very gruesome event in the Western hemisphere. And for those of you who don't know, 50 years ago, September 11th, 1973, was the date of the US-backed coup in Chile, which deposed uh, democratically elected socialist president Salvador Allende, uh, killed him and then replaced him with the neoliberal dictator by the name of Augusto Pinochet. Um, Pinochet, at the behest of the US, proceeded to wreak utter havoc on Chile's economy. To this day, Chile has the worst income inequality in all of Latin America, and it's due specifically to Pinochet and his policies. Um, Tricontinental, which Selena works for, has a great article on, or dossier, excuse me, on um, the 9-11 in Chile, which you can all check out. But the reason I bring this up is that Chile is one of many examples of countries in, in which the US has meddled in the name of promoting democracy or promoting US ideals or whatever the excuse is. Um, and Chile is one of many countries in which the US was successful in backing and actually carrying out a coup. And Chile also demonstrates that a real damage happens when those coups happen. It's not just that a government changes, it's that the hope of so many people is crushed and it's that livelihoods are changed. And I think from that point, it's so remarkable to me that Venezuela has resisted the ongoing attempts from the US for the past 20 something years to destabilize the government. And in, in spite of the US government's attempts, Venezuela's revolution remains as strong as ever. People are so committed to to the Bolivarian project and to one another. And there's so much for us to learn. And I think I just want to conclude on that note of hope. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, I listen to you and I get so inspired and I, I, I think like, okay, this person got it. <laughs> um, so yeah, we are over our time. And I, um, I think what we want to just like give a, a very quickly some things that you can do, how we can uh, show solidarity for Venezuela. I'm gonna put on the chat some petitions that Code Pink has. Uh, please go sign it, uh, come with us uh, and uh, to do advocacy with your congressperson and your, and your um, senators. You know, Venezuelans don't have the opportunity to do that. Let's do, let's do that. Let's make our voices heard. Uh, I'm going to put it on the chat. I'm going to let Selena also give you some updates and then we'll go and ask uh, if for those who wants to, to stay, ask a few uh, answer questions and answers that are in the chat. Yeah, I'll just say quickly, we are, we do have a fundraiser going at the moment. So I'm going to um, drop the link in the chat with the caveat that like Carlos Ron actually, uh, who's supposed to be with us today um, and couldn't make it, I think said very well that like, fundraising isn't something that you should do and like check off a box like look I raised like x amount of money and I did it and I helped people and now I'm all set like no like if we you know what if we're assuming everybody here on this call is here because we want to build a better world like it is part of an ongoing process of being committed to internationalism um, and building a revolution at home so I hope that that's the key takeaway um, and not just donating and then saying great but you know we do have access to to dollars and I think chipping in um, allows you know, supports the work of uh, that we're that we're talking about. So it's not it's not just that, and then you're all set. But um, but I hope the folks will donate if you're able, and also come on a future brigade, join an organization if you're not already in one, and um, work on building our revolution at home. And definitely uh, take advantage of our position in the belly of the beast, like Michelle said, to try to um, lift the sanctions. And then I think we're doing the Q and A, right? Yeah, thank you so much. Because, you know, uh, the opposition has so many resources to come and, and do that in Congress. So, yeah, please go and sign this petitions. And here, Selena put the the link to the donation, the donation link. And um, so I'm going I'm going to start with uh, one of the questions that are that is on the chat. Um, um, this questions go goes to L Laura. It's gonna be, uh, we lost our tra our translator, Leo. So uh, Adrian is going mm. to to do a, a consecutive interpretation. So this is gonna take a while. We're going to try to do it as fast as we can. So the question is for Laura, how do you reconcile the noble goal of socialism with the extraction of your greatest resource, oil, which will lead to human extinction? Si entendiste la pregunta. 
la tienes ahí, te la escribí en español. Sí. Bueno, eh, en principio estoy leyendo, tratando de leer, de leer el chat y ver las preguntas y es muy emocionante todo el interés que muestran las, y los participantes con el tema de Venezuela, conocer más sobre Venezuela. Creo que en principio yo comprometería el Instituto Simón Bolívar y, y en esta articulación con la brigada que insiste a darle continuidad a este tipo de espacios porque, bueno, no nos va a alcanzar el Laura. tiempo hoy. Ok, Laura. <laughs> so, first of all, I want to, first of all, um, it's, I'm excited looking at these Q, the Q&A and the chat to see all of the really great questions that people have about Venezuela and it's inspirational, um, in particular, from the, on behalf of the Simón Bolívar Institute, we're committed to continuing this solidarity project of the Kevin Zies Brigade. Creo que. Dale. Con respecto a la pregunta, eh, bueno, tenemos, eh, yo decía hace unos minutos, sí, sigue siendo eh, el petróleo la principal fuente de ingresos para el Estado venezolano. With regard to the question, um, yes, uh, petroleum is, continues to be the main source of income for the Venezuelan state. Aquí tenemos que dar un poco de contexto de situarnos en, en, en lo que llaman esta división internacional del trabajo y lo que correspondió. Um, so we need to provide a little bit of context. Did we lose Laura? Oh, uh, of international context um, and, and what, what has happened, international and historical context. Dale. Ok, se perdió un poquito la conexión. Ok, eh, que bueno, desde el contexto de los países del sur global y de lo que definió el capitalismo global, que nosotros teníamos que ser solo productores de materia prima. So in the context of the global south, as capitalism defines it, that we should just be producers of prime materials. Esta es la, esta es la herencia que nos deja ese sistema capitalista y ha sido capitalist system has inherited to us it's what it's given to us sin embargo ha sido como bien lo mencionaba Selina en su presentación el plan de la patria que es el plan uno de los instrumentos más importantes que nos legó el comandante Chávez um, but nonetheless um, well, well in the plan de la patria the plan of the nation which one is one of the most important instruments that commander Chávez left us eh, establece la, nuestra ruta hacia la construcción del socialismo es en, contraposi en contraposición al sistema devastador capitalista. Y eso so quiere decir que nosotros no that... aspiramos. Perdón. It, it establishes that our route towards socialism has to go against what capitalism has defined for us. And in part, that means that we aspire. Eh, Combinando con otra de las preguntas sobre los desafíos que tiene la revolución bolivariana, es precisamente superar esta dependencia de la renta petrolera. So here I'm combining it with one of the other questions, with which, which is more about what are the goals that the revolution, the Bolivarian revolution has, is one of the things is that we have to overcome this um, dependence on petroleum rents. Para eh, desarrollar el país en todas sus dimensiones, desarrollar la pequeña y mediana industria, desarrollar el campo. And so the goal then is to develop all, um, a wide variety of industries in, in the country, um, small business, um, agricultural industry, uh, to diversify. De hecho, el objetivo número cinco de este plan de la patria nos, nos llama al capítulo para defender y preservar la vida en el planeta. So actually, the, um, the objective number five, or the goal number five of the nation, national plan is to protect the planet um, and to uh, re reframe our model. Sin embargo, este desafío de desarrollar nuestra economía ha sido truncado bestialmente por la aplicación del bloqueo y las medidas coercitivas unilaterales. 
Uh, but nonetheless, this goal of developing and diversifying our economy has been violently truncated by the um, by the uh, unilateral coercive measures. Entonces, es una necesidad para la revolución bolivariana, para el pueblo venezolano, reconstruir su economía y retomar ese plan de independencia que, por supuesto, nos tiene que sacar de la dependencia únicamente de la explotación petrolera. So it's um it's something that we need to do um in as part of the Bolivarian Revolution is to um to move forward away from this dependence on uh oil exploitation um facing while facing these challenges. Es un principio básico, tenemos el derecho a desarrollarnos, desarrollarnos y nuestra ruta es desarrollarnos en el socialismo. Um, so it's just a basic issue. We have the right to develop and the route that we want to choose that we have chosen to develop is via socialism. Okay. Gracias. Gracias. I wanted to uh, just ask a, a short question, one of the other questions, and maybe uh, Carla um, Vargas can address this is just a question about food sovereignty. What percentage of food is being now produced in Venezuela? Um, if, if maybe Carlos can answer that. Eh, Carlos, la pregunta es, este, ¿qué porcentaje es sobre la soberanía alimentaria? ¿Cuán, cuál, ¿Cuánto porcentaje de comida se está produciendo actualmente en Venezuela? Mira, saber números exactos, hoy no los tenemos el porcentaje, digamos, de cuánto producimos soberanamente. Pero uh, so crisis... we don't have an exact number about how much we're producing um, it sovereignly right now. La crisis que fue muy difícil para todo el pueblo venezolano fue también una oportunidad para generar y desarrollar las fuerzas productivas de eh, las comunas y de todos los sectores sociales de este país. The crisis was very difficult for Venezuela, um, but at the same time, it presented us an opportunity to really develop agricultural production um, for communes and all across the country. En el año 2017-2018, la burguesía venezolana conspirando con, con el gobierno de los Estados Unidos, escondió la comida y principalmente el acceso a la comida básica de este país. So in 2017 and 2018, the Venezuelan elite, um, in combination working together with the U.S., um, with the U.S., uh, worked to basically hide um, or prevent people from accessing basic um, necessities, basic foods that, um, that poor Venezuelans needed for survival. Recordamos largas colas de 24 horas para solo obtener un producto para la alimentación de la familia. So we remember in that time period, long, long lines where people would have to wait 24 hours to just be able to access one of the products in the basic food basket that people would need for their family, to feed their family. Eso trajo como consecuencia que, y además una necesidad sentida en el pueblo, que había que producir alimento para garantizar la soberanía alimentaria de este país. As a result of this, it really created an urgent feeling within Venezuela that we needed to stop relying on these people and produce this, um, these, the, these foods for ourselves. Este pueblo logró resistir esos años a partir de la, de la pequeña y mediana producción familiar y social en el campo venezolano. We, um, our, our population managed to survive these years largely in thanks to small and medium le uh, level production um, in the Venezuelan countryside. Logró adaptarse el pueblo venezolano eh, cambiando inclusive su, sus esquemas de consumo. Eh, ejemplo, no teníamos el acceso a la harina, que es un elemento básico para la arepa, para la 
so, so the Venezuelan people, um, we managed to uh, change, even change, uh, survive this period by changing around our diet. So for example, we were not able to access a kind of flour that is very basic for making arepas, which is a staple in Venezuela. Y la gente logró cambiar su estilo a partir de la producción, de mucha producción de papa, de yuca, de plátano, y adaptarse en esos momentos para poder consumir un esquema distinto a alimentación eh, básico. And people started eating more potatoes and yuca and plantain and changing around their style of, of their diet so that they could survive this difficult period um, with sovereignty. A partir de esos años, hoy podemos decir que Venezuela es soberana en la producción de papa. No se importa nada de papas en este país. No se importan muchas de las hortalizas. Eh, zanahoria, calabacín, un, bueno, distintas hortalizas que las producimos soberanamente. So now, um, as a result of these changes and of the push toward food sovereignty, Venezuela doesn't import any potatoes and many of the vegetables that we consume, like carrots and other vegetables, um, we're producing them ourselves. Este país no está importando granos. Es más, estamos enviando granos a otros países. El caso de Vietnam, estamos enviando granos. Well, so we're not um, importing grains anymore. In fact, we're sending grains to other countries, um, for example, to Vietnam. Y bueno, así otros rubros, el caso de maíz, estamos por alrededor de un 80% de la producción nacional de maíz. El caso del arroz, eh, que es muy importante también para nuestra dieta, estamos, bueno, creo que, que, que no estamos importando arroz en este momento. O sea que hay una gran escala de la producción nacional que la satisfacemos a partir de la producción propia del país. So today we're um, we're uh, 80% of our corn consumption is domestic and uh, we're not importing um, rice anymore. So we've really moved to um, we've had a tremendous tremendous shift toward domestic agricultural uh, production for our domestic consumption. Y además, esos esquemas de producción que nacieron con la crisis, con, con estos años de crisis, la gente lo ha hecho y en las comunas logramos hacerlo desde una manera agroecológica y fue uno de los elementos eh, que desarrollamos como alternativa con los insumos agroecológicos para la producción. So this new, these new models of production that really arose out of the crisis are something that in the communes we have adopted um, with a specific focus on agroecological production um, to, again, ensure sovereignty. O sea, que una gran parte de esos alimentos, además que los producimos soberanamente, los producimos más sanos. So in addition to producing them in a sovereign manner, we're making sure that they're healthier than what we had previously been importing and consuming. Bueno, ahí, bueno, gran parte de eso, entonces, de esa producción, hay que sistematizarla, pero mucho de esa producción, lamentablemente, se la apropian los intermediarios y la terminan ellos sistematizando como producción de, del, del privado. Eso es un reto que so, tenemos en las comunas. One of the big challenges that we have, the communes have, is that we are um, doing a lot of agricultural production, but then the sale of what we produce is going through middlemen. So it's it's really ends up being just a capitalist product for profit. And um, and so we need to work to reducing the middlemen so we can ensure that what we're producing is um, is is going to where it's most needed. Gracias, Carlos. Gracias. Thank you so much.
So um, we're going to ask the last question because we really don't have much time. But I promise I'm going to copy all these questions and uh, make a follow-up email with, with the answers. And I'll follow up with our guests, too, so we can answer them via email. But I'm going to ask this last question and any last remark that you have, because this is the last. <laughs> okay, so we I've uh, this is a question from Marla. I read criticism of the government of an, on Venezuela analysis. What is the relationship between the government and the communes? Are the communes self-supporting? Do they receive government aid? Laura, te voy a dejar a ti responder esa pregunta. Y Carlos, te la escribo en español. Okay. Bueno, eh, la relación entre del gobierno revolucionario con las comunas es una relación estrecha, es decir, el gobierno revolucionario en su apuesta al socialismo no tiene una ruta fuera de la de la ruta comunal y las so comunas the, the relationship between the revolutionary government of Venezuela and that of the communes is very very tight. That's to say that um the that the government does not have an agenda that that does not include the communes or that the, the agenda is one and the same. It, it, it is to build the communes. Y las comunas eh, tienen dentro del gobierno revolucionario el gran aliado para construir sus proyectos de soberanía y de independencia. And so the communes have in the revolutionary Bolivarian government a uh, tremendous ally in their construction of um, independent um, governance projects. De hecho, los consejos comunales y las comunas están organizadas en todo el territorio nacional. Actually, communes and um, communal councils are organized um, everywhere throughout, um, all, all throughout the entire country. No solo es una organización de chavistas o de revolucionarios, es una estructura de la comunidad y del territorio donde está organizada la comuna y el consejo comunal. So, um, communes are not just organizations, they're not just chavista or revolutionary organizations, they're organizations of the communities where, where they are located. Claro, la orientación es hacia el socialismo. Y todo el que está en una comuna sabe que está construyendo el socialismo, pero no necesariamente son partidistas, de, o sea, están organizados en el partido de gobierno, ni están con la revolución, ni votan por el presidente Nicolás Maduro. So, of course, um, the communes are a socialist project, and yet many of the communes themselves are not necessarily voting for the governing party, they're not necessarily voting for Maduro, um, they're, it, uh, they, they have, some of them have different parties. Entonces, eh, la, ¿cómo se sostiene una comuna? Algo así decir, ¿cómo es el, el apoyo a la comuna? ¿Cómo es el presupuesto de la comuna? So then the question is, how does the, does the government support the communes? El, en, el, en el Estado venezolano existe el Consejo Federal de Gobierno, que es una estructura de la institucionalidad estatal. So in Venezuela, there's a federal um, council of governments, um, which is a federal level um, uh, group. Esa estructura tiene un fondo de recursos para aprobar, para aprobar proyectos que se desarrollan en los territorios. And so this structure has a resource um, fund that is exists to approve projects in the different territories of the nation. Entonces la, la forma de organización es el llamado siempre a la organización de estas estructuras de consejos comunales y comunas a presentar proyectos de desarrollo de su territorio. So these communes and the communal councils, the way that they interact primarily with the state in this sense is that they, they will present their development projects um, to this entity of the state um, to request funding from, um, Entonces, from the federal government. 
es, es la estructura comunal, es la asamblea de ciudadanos y ciudadanos quien decide y define cuál es el proyecto que van a desarrollar. Casi todas las comunas de la Unión Comunera, por ejemplo, apoyan, so it's, so it's... Eh, desarrollan proyectos productivos. So it's the communal structures and the communal councils themselves that collectively, through their own democratic processes, determine which projects they want to fund. And by and large, it's, um, it's economic productive projects that they request funding for from the federal government. Entonces, para desarrollar esos proyectos productivos que están en el campo, que, que ameritan espacio de tierra, que, aperi, que ameritan la justicia social que a la población que está en ese territorio. So in order to develop and support these projects that, that deserve, um, they deserve land, that deserve economic support to be developed. Depende de la firme convicción de un gobierno revolucionario que cree en el pueblo y que transfiere poder al pueblo. So this really requires the firm conviction of a revolutionary government that believes in the people and that is eager and willing to transfer power um, to the communes. No son pocos los recursos que han llegado a las comunas y a los consejos comunales. Son proyectos millonarios de mille, miles y millones de dólares, por ejemplo. It's, it, it's, it's not just a little bit of support that the government gives to the communes. Um, they, the government has provided projects with millions of dollars um, to the different communes, to their projects. Y eso también está afectado, Carlos, en su intervención primera, eh, partida de decir, no es lo mismo las comunas Hace 10 años, cuando se organizaban y tenían acceso a estos recursos, que la realidad que estamos viviendo hoy. And so that's something that it's not the same when, you know, 10 years ago when the communes were organizing and seeking out these resources from, um, from the reality that we're, we're seeing today. Entonces, eh, hay una relación estrecha, hay un, una apuesta sincera y política hacia el Estado comunal y la ruta que nos legó el comandante Chávez. So there is a very close relationship between um, the, the communal state, the route that Com Commander Chávez left us to um, move forward with uh, communes as the basis of the revolution. Y ahora que estamos frente a un posible escenario electoral de elección presidencial, And now that we are um, facing upcoming presidential elections, está muy claro que la apuesta de la derecha es destruir todo lo que sea comuna, consejo comunal, poder popular. Está en su discurso. One of the things that we see from the um, speeches, the discourse of the right wing of the opposition, is that they really want, they're attacking communes, um, they're attacking uh, popular power and communal councils. Entonces el destino, el destino de la patria, el destino de la soberanía, nos llama a construir juntos, pueblo y gobierno, consejos comunales, comunas y gobierno revolucionario, nuestra lucha por el socialismo bolivariano y feminista. <laughs> so our, our destiny, our um, continuing as a revolutionary Bolivarian government is completely tied with the future of the communes. We need to fight together against this threat um, to continue creating our Bolivarian feminist revolutionary um, vision. Carlos. Sí. Eh, buena pregunta. <laughs> Good question. Mira, ningún, todo proceso tiene contradicciones y es normal. No hay ningún proceso en el mundo y menos un proceso revolucionario que se haga en total paz. Look, all um, political processes have their contradictions. This is normal. There's no, um, there's, there's no political project or process in the world that can be carried out with like complete um, peace. Y esas contradicciones, eh, que no son contradicciones en el fondo, a veces, mu muchas veces, sino contradicciones de cómo miramos los procesos, hacen también que hayan crítica, y la crítica vista desde, el, desde una crítica sana, constructiva, es muy necesaria. 
And so these contradictions um, mean that sometimes there's criticism and, and healthy criticism is fine within a political process. Lo que nosotros dejamos claro ante el mundo es que este gobierno del presidente Nicolás Maduro es un gobierno aliado del proyecto comunal, es un gobierno que está a la orden y al servicio del proyecto comunal. But what we want to make very clear in uh, speaking to the world is that this government of Nicolás Maduro is a government that is an ally of the communal project that completely supports communes in Venezuela. Con todos los niveles de contradicciones que pueden existir con sectores dentro del gobierno, con algunas personalidades, pero en... Eh, de forma conjunta o forma integral, el gobierno eh, en lo práctico lo demuestra, como lo decía Laura, eh, tiene una, una cercanía al proyecto comunal, una, un, un nivel de relación con el proyecto comunal. So there may be contradictions, there may be certain politicians or individuals with whom we have conflict, but overall this government has been tremendously supportive of the communal project. Este gobierno en los hechos, decía Laura, el, el, el ejemplo del Consejo Federal de Gobierno, es muy importante porque Chávez construyó instancias donde los consejos comunales y las comunas tenían acceso directo a los recursos del Estado. So this, this government and what Laura was talking about was the, the federal entity that um, Chavez created so that communal councils and communes can have direct access to request funds and resources from the government. Pero también, inclusive dentro del el gobierno eh, con el comandante Chávez y lo seguimos impulsando, tiene un ministerio del poder popular para las comunas y movimientos sociales. But also the government, um, you, you know, Chavez created this and we continue to have it. There is an entire ministry that's devoted to popular power and communes to support it. Ahora, ahora, este gobierno actúa en el marco de un estado que es el viejo estado burgués, es el viejo estado que reproduce la lógica rentista. So this government has a contradiction and a challenge, which is that it operates within the framework that was left by the old bourgeois state. And so there are contradictions within that. It's a bourgeois state based on capitalist logics. El reto planteado por el comandante Chávez a partir del proyecto comunal es transformar el Estado también. Por eso se hablaba de un Estado comunal. So the challenge that, um, that Chavez gave to all of us with the communal project was to actually transform the nature of the bourgeois state, transform it into a communal state. Porque el problema del petróleo, y el, lo, lo articulo con la pregunta anterior, es que hoy seguimos dependiendo de la renta petrolera, pero el problema no es solamente la dependencia de la renta, sino que la renta permió toda la cultura política venezolana. Because the problem, you know, the problem with being an oil state, and this relates to the previous question, is, is not just that we entirely depend on oil profits, it's that this fact has permeated every aspect of Venezuelan culture. La construcción del Estado venezolano en el siglo XX y todavía en el siglo XXI es un Estado rentista y toda la cultura que se permea a partir de allí, tanto en el Estado como en la sociedad, es la cultura del rentismo. So the, the culture that was created in the, um, in, the, in the 20th and even in the 20th, into the 21st century was a rentier's economy um, that continues to be the case, that it's a capitalist economy based on oil profits. El reto que hoy tenemos es el reto planteado por el comandante Chávez. Utilizar la renta petrolera, porque es la principal fuente de ingreso, pero ponerla al servicio del desarrollo nacional. 
So the the challenge that we have today is what Chavez um, proposed uh, and carried out was to use these profits from oil that had been the basis of our society, um, but not towards capitalism and instead towards improving the lives of people within Venezuela, the Venezuelan population. Ninguna comuna es autosuficiente. Ninguna comuna, como ninguna organización en el país es autosuficiente. No, there's no commune that's completely self-sufficient, just like there's no organization in the country that's 100% self-sufficient. Depende de la renta, de la, del apalancamiento de la renta para desarrollar las fuerzas productivas. Es una necesidad de todos los sectores en este país. So they still require to, finances, they still require money in order to increase their um, development uh, potential and their productive capacities. Ahora, entonces, lo importante de la unión y lo importante de que las fuerzas populares se articulen y se construyan como organización nacional es también para la disputa por la renta. So the um, the importance <laughs> I'm not exactly yeah. sure how to translate this. I'm sorry, but the the importance of the of the union of the of the communes and of the popular power um, has to do with the dispute around around money around financial capital and how to use it. Porque bueno, la renta eh, ha sido utilizada también por la burguesía para desarrollarse. Entonces nosotros decimos que la organización popular tiene que también visualizar la disputa por la renta petrolera para ponerla al servicio del desarrollo de las fuerzas productivas comunales. So what we're saying is that previously um, petroleum profits had been used by the bourgeoisie to develop themselves for their own ends, but what we need to ensure is that any petroleum profits are really going toward the development and the betterment of the lives of the people. En ese sentido, se recibe ayuda del gobierno, no en las cantidades como recibíamos antes con el comandante Chávez, producto de, del bloqueo y de las sanciones. But no, so now we're still getting money from the government, not in the, at the levels that we received previously, um, in, and that's directly in relation to the blockade, which has, um, which has cut off our, our oil profits as a country. Pero nuestro reto es recibir muchísimo más, porque la renta petrolera es la renta del pueblo venezolano, de todo el pueblo venezolano. But our goal is to be able to get a whole lot more money because that um, that those oil that oil is uh, belongs to the Venezuelan people and we need to be able to use it toward the the betterment of our of our. Y eso para poner al servicio los proyectos que estamos desarrollando, sobre todo el proyecto los proyectos que desarrollan fuerzas productivas, como bueno ustedes pudieron ver el trapiche en Cumanacoa, que es la principal objetivo en estos momentos para que esa comuna se desarrolle. So, uh, then again, um, like you saw in the example of the sugar mill in the Cinco Fortalezas commune, we want to see projects of the communes develop. We want to see them move forward. And so those oil profits, any oil profits should be going towards these sorts of projects. Y así cada uno de los, de los espacios que venimos construyendo a nivel de la producción de café, de la producción de láctea. Ah, bueno, queremos decirle también que parte del aporte de la brigada Kevin Cis enviamos a la finca Santa Cruz. Ya esta semana se dio la primera producción de, quecho, de, de queso. Y bueno, estamos esperando una brigada que está allá en Santa Cruz. Y bueno, estamos esperando el video, estamos esperando la foto de todo el tema de la producción de queso a partir de ese apoyo. So, uh, so uh, part of the support that uh, the Kevin Cis brigade was gay, um, Gave went toward the um, uh, uh, machinery to for, uh, to uh, create cheese in one of the communes that had a lot of milk but didn't wasn't able to bring it to market and so they've already made their first batch of cheese and so it's these productive projects that um, we're really looking forward to developing in collaboration with um, Kevin Z's brigade. 
Así es. Bueno, miren, para finalizar, cuando vean críticas, no se asusten, no hay problema. Lo, so, las contradicciones son normales. Y in some, lo, if you see criticism, don't get scared. These contradictions always exist and they're productive. Sí, y lo que estamos seguros es que esas contradicciones las vamos a resolver nosotros internamente en el diálogo, en los mecanismos de los revolucionarios y las revolucionarias. And what we are sure of is that we are going to resolve these contradictions ourselves internally using the revolutionary uh, mechanisms that we have available to us. Gracias. Gracias. Gracias a usted. I cannot find a better way to end this webinar. Uh, David, I don't know if you want to say something. No, I just really appreciate everyone who participated in the excellent questions. And we will be sending out um, to, to the emails of people who signed up um, the uh, links to the program when it's going to be on YouTube and the questions and answers. And I did put in the chat that there's going to be another delegation report back with the many of the other delegates in the, there are over 10 more, and it will be a, on the What the F is going on in Latin America program where they can talk about their reflections and experiences coming up on September 21st. We will send more information about that as well. And I just wanted to thank everyone for, and uh, Adrian, thanks so much for pitching in on the interpretation and Laura and Carlos, mil gracias for estar aquí con nosotros. It's, um, and that's all I wanted to say. And thanks Michelle for hanging in there. Yeah. Even though you're not feeling so good these days. Gracias. Gracias a todos. Thank you so much. See you soon. Gracias. Thank you, everybody. Como Viva una, la solidaridad. Como una o nada. <laughs> como una o nada. Como una o nada. Viviremos Gracias bien. Gracias por todo. Por el Camino cariño. Por la solidaridad. Los queremos mucho. <laughs>